the last part of our chapter on probability. You can see it there. Contingency tables, very, very cool, very exciting. Uh, we're just going to dive right into this example. We'll explain what's happening in that table and the problems uh, just uh, in this practice problem and the next one. So here we go. Practice number six says, are married people happy? The table below shows results from the 2002 General Social Survey. Okay, so checking out that table, you see there's lots of different rows and columns. So across the top, you know, we see people who are very happy in their marriage, right? Pretty happy, not happy. Uh, and then we've got some totals there on the far right. And then the columns, male, female, and the totals. So just kind of take a moment and, and let that kind of sink in. And what I like to do uh, when the class is in person, right, is just kind of see if uh, where people's intuition is. Like, can, you know, if I say like, hey, from, from this survey, how many of them were pretty happy males, right? How many pretty happy males were there, you know, that you see in that table? And, and most people say, okay, there's 95 pretty happy males, right? The, the box that lines up with the pretty happies and the males, okay? What if I said, hey, how many total males are there? And well, that's on the far right in that first row, 325 total males. Okay, so we can see kind of the males broken down into how they were, if they were very happy, pretty happy, or not happy, and then the total number of males. Same with females, right? We see there's 149 very happy females, and then there's 120 pretty happies, okay, and so on. Uh, nine not happy male and female, okay? And then the total number of females there, 268. Uh, what if I said, hey, how many total very happy people were there? Just male or female, how many total very happy people? You say, okay, well, there's 370 in the total column for the very happy. So that's all the males and females. What if I said, this is a good question. What if I said, just how many people were there? How many married people were a part of this survey in total, whether they were male or female or however their happiness level, just the total number of people that took this survey. Well, that's in the lower right, 603. It was kind of cool about uh, this contingency table, right? So if we add up all the males, then we get the total males, 325. If we add up all the females, we get that total. If we take the total males and the total females, well, that adds up to 603. Well, we can do the same thing with the happiness levels. So, you know, take all of the very happies, 370, and all the pretty happies, 215, and all the not happies, 18. Add all those together, well, you would also get 603, right? So it all, um, it's all consistent. It all matches however you want to add it. Okay, very, very nice. You know what, just kind of on this note, are married people happy? I really like uh, this particular... Uh, context uh, and let me just I'll just talk for a moment let me tell you as someone who got married I got married when I was in my 30s I was 33 when I got married um, and let me tell you being married I am far happier than when I was as single and I was a happy single guy you know I was v totally content uh, wanted to be married but um, marriage far, far happier, far surpasses the happiness I had when I was single. Now, that said, marriage comes with a very high price. There's a big cost to pay. Uh, when we say happy, you know, we, we really want to say like fulfilled. Okay, so there's got to be times, and I'm, I'm just saying this because I, I bet a lot of people, a lot of you guys are single, and you you know you're you're thinking about being married you want to be married there's a huge price to pay and there's going to be times where you definitely don't feel happy um, especially in that first year no doubt um, but let me tell you pay the price it's worth it um, you will be uh, you I, th I think most people will find themselves being much happier um, if they pay that price. And then if you want to think about kids, well, life is even more fulfilling with kids. There's even more joy, but there's a far, even far bigger price to pay for that, even far bigger than the price 
to be married, which was a huge one. Okay, okay. Um, you know what? One thing I got to say this: don't get married, though, to become happy. Right? If you're not happy now, getting married that's not going to solve anything. Um, in fact, you'll be far more miserable and lonely um, if you get married for that reason. Um, getting married, it's a sacrifice. Um, and so if you're getting married to fill some kind of a hole, that, that's terrible. That's a terrible, terrible idea. Um, what, where, the place you want to be at when you're single is content. You know, you know what? You, you say to yourself, you know what? I'd really like to be married one day, but... If I if I was single for the rest of my life, you know, I wouldn't choose that, but but I could live with it. I'd be content. Okay, then you know you're ready to be married. Then you know you're going to be ready to pay that high high price. Okay, okay. Let's 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 get into uh the questions here. Um <laughs> part A says, "What is the probability that a randomly chosen married person is female?" And very happy. Okay, how are we going to answer this? How are we going to read this? So what we need to do, um, female and very happy. We need to locate the very happy females. How many very happy females are there? Well, I think we said it even a moment ago. There's 149 very happy females. Okay. And we're going to divide that by the total number of married people. Okay, so the probability that a randomly chosen married person, so everybody here, the chances that they're both female and very happy. And so it's probably not a surprise. Let me just show you here on the screen. Finally, um, zoom in, zoom out. Okay, there we go. The probability, and we you kind of see the notation, right? Probability being female and very happy. Take the very happy females, divide it by the total number of married people. 149 out of 603, and that gives you 0 0.247. So out of all the people there, if we randomly choose one person, they got to be female and very happy. The prob the chances from our survey here, 0 0.247. Okay. Hmm, how about part B, a little different? What's the probability that a married person is simply very happy? Out of all the people there, you choose someone, what's the chances they're very happy? Now here they could be male or female, right? So we'll look at the total of the very happy people. That's 370. And we'll divide it by the total number of people surveyed in all, the 603. And we'll get the probability of being very happy is 370 divided by 603. Turns out to be 0 0.614. Pretty cool. Hmm, okay. In part C and D, we got a little something different. Now, the, this is interesting. What is the probability that a married person is female given they are very happy? Now, that's interesting, given, and that's definitely something new here that we have not encountered yet in this chapter. The probability that a married person is female given that they are very happy. Okay, as soon as they say given they are very happy. What we mean is we're actually not considering everybody in the survey anymore. If we say given they are very happy, we're saying let's only look at the very happy people, right? It's like given they're very, it's like that's already, you know, a quality that, you know, a group possesses. So ignore everybody else. So only take those that are very happy. What's the probability that they are female as well? Okay. So the chances that they're female given that, so we already know we're only looking at the very happy. So we can just focus completely on that first column, the very happy column. And we'll say, okay, well, we want to know out of all, all the people that are very happy, how many were female? Well, 149. And then we're only going to divide that by the 370 because we're only considering the very happies. We're ignoring everybody else. So here you go. There's also a new notation. And I'll show you that here on the screen. 
So here we can see our answer, right? Only considering those that are very happy, 149 are female, divided by total number of very happy, gets us the 0 0.403. Okay, now what is this notation? The notation for given is this straight line, right? So up here, you know, we can write and, female and very happy. All right, no problem. For given, there's actually a, a notation for it, and it's this vertical line. F given, female given, very happy. And now that vertical line, it, it actually has some connection to us mathematically, right? It almost looks like a division symbol, right? A lot of times you see a division symbol as like this slash. That's kind of what's happening here. It's kind of a division, right? The females that are very happy divided by the total number that are very happy. So only looking at the very happy column, 149 out of the total, 370. And in a similar way, part D, well, I shouldn't show you the answer. Ah, let's read it. What is the probability that a married person is female given they are pretty happy? Okay, if we're if it's given that they are pretty happy, it's like we're we're just assume we're already assuming that they're pretty happy. So we only look at the pretty happy column, right? Which has 215 total people. And we're saying, okay, out of those 215, what's the chances of being female? And well, same idea. The probability of being fe female given pretty happy is 120 out of 215 which works out to 0.558. So in other words, out of the people that are pretty happy, there's a little over 55%, almost 56% are female. Out of the people that are very happy, it's 40%, about 40% are female, which would be almost about 60% male, right? Okay, interesting, interesting. So look out for those with contingency tables. Okay, moving on to number seven. Can you tell I love contingency tables? They're so interesting. There's so much information there packaged into that, into just those numbers with all the totals. Okay, anyway, practice number seven. This one's pretty cool. Say 13% of students are computer science majors. We'll call that event A. All right, 15% of students have taken discrete mathematics. So discrete mathematics is a, a higher level math course that a lot of computer science majors, it turns out, have to take. So 15% of all students have taken discrete mathematics. We're going to call that event B. And 84% of students are not computer science majors and have not taken discrete mathematics. Okay, well, most people are not that major and have not taken this class. Makes sense, 84%. So the question is, just based on that, what is the probability that a student is not a computer science major, but has taken discrete mathematics? You're thinking, wait a second. Are you kidding me? You're not giving much to go on here, right? You're telling me the percentage of people that are computer science majors, the percentage of people who have taken discrete math, and 84% are not, you know, so, okay, just based on that, I'm supposed to answer what's the probability that a student is not a computer science major, but has taken discrete mathematics. Doesn't seem like I have enough information. Actually, we do, before trying to answer, consider if a contingency table would help. Hint, hint, obviously, okay, that's where we're going with this. So, let's kind of set up this problem here, and I'm just writing down a few um, ideas, make things a little bit easier to process this information. So they said event A, this was in the problem, but okay, event A is being a computer science major. Event B is having taken this particular class, which turns out most of these guys have to do, but other people take it as well, all right? And then they're saying the question, what's the probability that a student is not a computer science major, so that'd be a complement, but they have taken this class. So not a computer science major, computer science major, and they've taken the class. Hmm, all right, that's what we're supposed to answer. And we're supposed to create a contingency table to help us out. Interesting. 
So here's how we go about it. If we have A and B, you know, and we're involving the complements, here's, here's how we're going to set up this table. It's pretty cool. There we go. I'll just show you the whole thing. So we're going to have a row for A and a row for A complement and a total. We're going to have a column for B, a column for B complement, and a total. Obviously, you can switch rows and columns with the A's, you know, A, A complement, right? You could, But I, I kind of like this, right? Row, row, column, column for the Bs. So we're going to start to fill this in with what uh, the, the percentages they've given us. And we're going to be able to answer this question. A complement and B is pretty sweet. Okay, let's start from the top. Say 13% of students are computer science majors. Okay, where would we put the 13% or really what we're going to do is fill in 0.13. Where would that go? So now notice they're not mentioning this discrete mathematics class. They said just computer science majors only. That is the total for the computer science majors. 13% of all the students. All right. So we're not considering this at all. Then they also say 15% of all students have taken discrete mathematics. Well, where should the 0.15 go? Notice there, they're not mentioning anything about being a computer science major. They're just talking about taking this class. So there's taking the class. It's the total of all the students, the computer science majors and the non-computer science majors, right? Everybody who's taken this class, 0.15 in the total. And then they say 84% of students are not computer science majors and have not taken discrete mathematics. So we need to find the box that has both these, right? Not a computer science major. Okay, well, that's A complement. And have not taken discrete math. Well, that's B complement. So right here, this is 84% of students. They're not this major and they have not taken that class. Okay, now it turns out there's one more box that we can fill in and they didn't even have to say it to us explicitly. It would be nice if we were in class and I'd be like, which box do we already know the answer to the value even without being told? And it turns out it's the total of the totals. The total of the totals is all of the students and all of the students is 100%. So I'm going to put 1.00 right there. Because when you put everybody together, well, of course, that's 100% of the students. Okay, so with these three told to us, and the fact that we know this already, we can now go and fill in all the rest of the boxes, knowing how these contingency tables work, right? They all have to add up you know, and they add and they all add together and it all works out. So let's see, where should we start? Um, there's a couple places we could start. I'm going to go right here, right? So we know these totals have to add together. So if this is 0.13, the one do we need to add to get 1.00 and well, it's 0 0.87, right? So we can fill that in. And maybe this one down here, 0.15, this, this would have to be 0 0.85 to add together to get one. Okay, now maybe, you know, here and here we can fill in this part. This has to be 0 0.03 for those to add together to get this one. Uh, maybe we go up here, you know, this has to be 0 0.01. Only 1% are in that particular box, okay. And then here, well, it's 0 0.01 and 0 0.13, so this would have to be 0 0.12 to add up and everything should let's let's just be really let's let's check every row and every column so these add together good these add together these add together perfect and then going down those add together those add together those add together it's kind of like a sudoku right you kind of like check every row and column if you're familiar with that all right so it looks good i think we filled it out accurately checking everything now we can answer the question the probability a complement and B. Well, all we have to do is find that box, and A complement and B is right here. So the probability of 
not being a computer science major, but you have taken the course, 0 0.03 is our answer. 3% of students fall into that particular category. Aren't contingency tables amazing? Wow. Okay, well, that does it for our practice problems. I just want to finish up this chapter um, by mentioning the approaches to probability there at the bottom. So I'm just going to read this. It says, all probabilities calculated in this chapter have been done using what we call the classical approach. This uses the formula probability of event A equals the number of ways A's, A can occur divided by the total number of outcomes and assumes outcomes are equally likely. Okay. A different method, though, is often more useful in statistical studies. It is called the relative frequency approach and uses the formula, the probability of event A equals the number of times A has occurred divided by the total number of times the procedure was performed. Typically, we're not working with you know a deck of cards or a roll of a die. Actually, what we saw here with contingency tables is a lot closer uh, to the way we see probabilities done uh, in statistics, right? It's, it's based on a survey or an experiment, right? So we don't have some theoretical, um, you know, probability in mind, like, you know, like a die roll or something like we think, okay, what we need to do is perform this procedure or experiment many, many times. And we'll just see out of those how many times event A occurs. Okay, and so we'll say, all right, well, how many times did we observe it versus the total number of times we did this procedure? Um, and that's that's usually how these things work, probabilities work uh, in the real world. Um, this is a good approach when the likelihood of individual outcomes is uncertain. One could perform an experiment several times or collect data. In this approach, it is best to follow the law of large numbers that a procedure is repeated many, many times, um, that as a procedure is repeated many, many times, the relative frequency tends toward the actual probability. Yeah, the more you do something, then the closer it's going to get to, um, you know, what the, uh, the actual probability we would say. Okay, we'll end with that. Um, chapter three is done here.